Justin Williams here with Dirt Time Adventures. I'm real excited to bring you guys another episode of the Pathfinder Phase 1 series. And today we're actually going to be covering Block 3. And we're looking at self-aid. And specifically self-aid because you're going to be providing first aid on yourself. Whereas oftentimes when we think of first aid, we think of that as providing uh, a health care to an individual. And so we're actually looking at self-aid and how we're going to aid ourselves in the event of a uh, mechanical injury, a cut, or some type of accident. And so self-aid is the topic today. I'm really looking forward. We've got a lot of information to try to cover to put in this one video, um, but I think we can do it. So uh, I do want to throw out a disclaimer. Um, I actually have a background in uh, medical field as a nurse tech. Um, I worked in hospice for a year and then uh, did home health care um, with uh, different organizations for quite a while. And I even got my uh, nurse tech certification um, right, out of, right out of the military. And so I uh, definitely got a background of medical field. But here's the thing, I would not consider myself an expert. And so everything that I'm going to share today is just practical advice and things that I have learned through research and experience and I want to encourage you before you go out and practice some of these skills make sure that you get adequate training in first aid especially in wilderness first aid and so uh, um, that's my precursor my advisor da, da, da. you hurt yourself worse by trying some of these things at your own fault um, and so uh, anyway so the first thing we're going to talk about is bleeding and burns and I'm going to be referencing my field guide uh, my little field book that I've been working in for the Pathfinder system because the amount of content is just so much there's no way I can remember it all um, but in module one of block three we're looking at bleeding and burns and in block two I actually cut myself and did a self-aid video in it and so I'm probably going to show it right now Hi guys, Justin here, Dirt Time Adventures. I'm going to be going over a new block today, and that's first aid. I'm actually uh, working on block two right now as I record this video, but uh, what better time to shoot a first aid video than whenever you actually need first aid. And so, uh, take a look here. Got you a nice little saw cut right there, man. Just took a saw blade holding the beam the branch broke and because it was elevated and when it did it kicked my saw out and bam so uh, we could do a little first aid today and uh, real life first aid not just practicing so gonna bandage this up and get it clean and so with with any cut the most important thing that you need to do is to clean the wound first so I'm gonna go over and clean the wound and I got two kit items that are perfect for this and one being the bandana and two being the duct tape cargo tape so I knew it'd come in handy so uh, stick with me and we'll get this done and you'll find one of the main things about first aid when you're the actual only person to provide it and you're injured is you're actually twice as likely to injure yourself while trying to provide first aid if you're not careful because you don't have full use of your limbs you're using a knife trying to cut a thin piece of fabric and you're going to end up cutting yourself with a knife and having a worse injury. And so, start a little slit there, tear off a piece like so long. Perfect. And so, there's my bandage. Take my water bottle. So I'm actually in a sense using four of my kit items here. My container contains my water, my knife, to cut the bandage, my bandana for bandage, and my duct tape for the adhesive to keep it in place. So here we go. It's already, tell how long it's been, it's already clotting up on me. And I like this little nozzle on here because it allows me to measure how much water actually comes out of it. I can go ahead and use the rest of my bandana 
to wipe it down. So I don't know if you can see that there. Let's see if I can catch that in the light there. So sorry guys about the footage here. And there's my gash. Just once again you want to clean it out the best you can. And you don't want to waste all your good water too. I'm still gonna be working out here and don't want that so alright. Alright, so guys we're gonna take this. Wrap it. You don't want to wrap it too tight, but you want it tight enough that there's pressure there that'll stop the bleeding. On my tape here, you don't need a full wad, but the great thing about cargo tape is once you get it started, you can determine the size of piece you want cut off. So I'm going to take right there, and instead of taking the whole roll, take a little thin strip. Get it wrapped back around. All right, guys, better than a band aid. So awesome. Stick with me. We're going to go over some other first aid stuff on blisters, breaks, and sprains, and all kinds of good stuff. So stick with me, guys. All right, so that was a minor cut in how you can take care of that and how you can apply simple self-aid to a minor cut. It's nothing new. That's nothing that you haven't done a million times before. And if you're a redneck, then you have, you're not a stranger to duct tape at all. You used it a million times. Um, but that's a quick example of how you can expediently provide field care and first aid for yourself in that event. So exercise one is looking at three ways to control bleeding. Now, of course, there are other ways you can do it, um, but we're going to be talking about three primary, and I may even mention a few others. But the first one is to apply direct pressure. You can also apply indirect pressure, but we're going to look at direct pressure, and that's where you can either use a pressure dressing, put on a simple bandage like um, I showed in the previous video that I just showed, or you can even, if it's a severe wound, you can pack it, and that's called a pack wound. And so you're, you're wanting to stop the bleeding as quickly as possible by applying pressure to the wound. And uh, once again, your first and most important priority is to stop the bleeding initially, but then if it's a severe wound, to get emergency medical help as soon as possible. So there's direct pressure. The second way is elevation, and that's where you're going to raise up the wounded extremity above your heart level. And so if I had a leg and I gashed it open, I'm wanting to get it parallel or above my heart level. And if it's an arm, that's not so hard, especially in your forearm or something, just keep it up high. Um, if, if you needed to, you could use a, um, a jacket or something to wrap your arm to immobilize it so it stays more elevated to your heart. So there's nothing new about elevation. The third one is tourniquet. And a tourniquet is kind of a last measure whenever you can't get direct pressure or indirect pressure elevation to stop the bleeding. You use a tourniquet. And the tourniquet, it can be used with uh, uh, straps. It could be used with um, clothing that's been torn, torn clothing, tattered clothing, and you could also use bandanas to do tourniquets. If you carry um, slingshots, you can use a slingshot band, so that's one of the great ones, straps, like I said, uh, cordage, any of those things could be used for a tourniquet. And the key to the tourniquet is you want to apply it above the wound but below a joint if at all possible because the, the reality is with the tourniquet, if it's applied properly, you're most likely going to lose a limb, but it's going to save your life. And so, for instance, if I had to put a tourniquet on my arm, you know, if it was real severe cut right here, then I would want to try to put it above the wound, but below my elbow joint. And so that way, if I was to lose something, it would be past that joint. And uh, so the tourniquet, and once again, you know, 
it's it's vital that you realize that there's a lot of severity that takes place when you try to implement these type of first aid um, devices such as a tourniquet you, you're putting yourself at risk for further injury if you don't know what you're doing so be sure to study and do your research and get some qualified instruction I also wouldn't practice putting a tourniquet on yourself for more than a second or so because you're going to risk injuring yourself uh, a fourth way that you can stop bleeding once again is what is called cauterization now I'm not a big fan of cauterization because I just think you're putting yourself and making yourself to be a proponent for further injury and so not only are you going to be bleeding but now you're going to put second or third degree burns on yourself um, so once again if you have qualified research and you have qualified instruction then that might be something for you to consider and that's where you're using extreme heat or fire in this case and burning that wound shut and so cauterization a fifth method that I didn't even put in my book but as I've been studying herbal medicines would be using a plant called yarrow and breaking it down exposing some of the the juices and even the flower heads and packing your wound with an herbal uh, herbal thing such as yarrow herbal plant and that's going to do some cauterization as well so those are more than three ways to um, to stop bleeding or to help control. Now that you have an understanding on how to control bleeding, I want to demonstrate quickly for you how to do a simple pressure dressing. Once again, you can use something as simple as a bandana that has so many uses for this purpose. In the previous video with the bleeding, the cut, I showed a simple um, finger wrap with using the bandana and some duct tape. And you can do the same thing with this in a lot larger size. And so. Being aware of where the wound is, and this one, we're wanting to create layers to absorb blood. And so, you're going to take your bandana and create some layers with it by folding it on itself just like you would if you were to wear it on your head. And so, once again, trying to create as much padding as possible, then laying the fatty padded portion on the wound and then simply turning it over and tying it off and then just tie it again and if you weren't able you weren't able to get a real tight pack that's where the duct tape would come in great because you could use the duct tape to come back around it and make it even tighter But once again we're not trying to make a tourniquet we're trying to make a pressure dressing that's going to apply pressure to the wound that's going to allow you to stop bleeding or help at least control the bleeding and so that's a simple pressure dressing if you were carrying a first aid kit You'd want to definitely use gauze or pads, pack it on top of it, use an ace bandage to wrap it. But in the field, a bandana works great. Or if you have an extra shirt, tear off a piece and put it to use, guys. In exercise two, we're looking at the three degrees of burns, the three different levels of burns. And the first degree is first degree, and the second is second degree, and the third is third degree. And in the first degree, it's the most common burn that you're going to experience, and that's the first degree burn, which you're just going to have a little bit of redness, a little bit of heat to touch, and then it's probably going to hurt a little bit. The second degree is where you're actually having blisters pop up on the, the skin, and these blisters are going to hurt really badly. They're going to be painful, and sometimes they even will pop and be exposed, and it's just, it's just a painful thing. And those are third degree burns, however, are the most severe in the fact that they are causing the most damage to your skin. They're also potentially damaging your nerves that are under your skin layers. And so third degree burns, you want to make sure that you get these treated by professionals and be sure that you're taking care of them properly and so that they don't cause 
permanent damage. And so third degree burns are no laughing matter. There's something you need to take Second and third care degree of. burn, it's important that you take these practical steps to treating yourself in these burns. And so first and most importantly is if you have clothing that has been burnt to that skin, do not remove it. Do not remove the burnt clothing. You can remove the loose layers, but don't remove the burnt clothing. Also, you don't want to use a cleaner on the wound. And, and it's just, you want to make sure that you're rinsing it and flushing it with cold water, but you don't want to use a cleaner and you don't want to be rubbing it. Um, and at a second or third degree stage, you don't want to be putting ointments and sprays and stuff on it. They really need to be treated effectively. So once you've flush the wound and, and, and use cold water. So once you flush the burns, it's important that you put a clean, dry cloth or bandage over the wound to keep it from getting infected until a doctor or physician can take a look at it. And as you cover that, be sure that you monitor yourself and, that, and any individual you might be treating for any type of shock. Um, or any type of other injury. And so that's the three stages of burns. So in module two, we're gonna be looking at bites and stings. And each and every one of us has either, especially if you've been out in the woods, has either been bitten or stung by some type of insect. And it's important that you know how to take care of those bites and stings. And so in this exercise, exercise one, we're to research two different herbs and what they look like and how to use them and prepare them for a sting or bite. And the two that I chose primarily are plantain and jewelweed. Uh, you can also use yarrow. I mentioned yarrow earlier, but you can also use yarrow to help treat these things if you cannot find plantain or jewelweed. But the great thing about plantain is it's everywhere. You can find it in anywhere that there's disturbed ground or you can find it along field edges. And it's a very identical plant. And uh, I'll show a video, uh, a picture of one here. And that'll give you an idea of what it looks like. And we'll also go take a look and um, show you the one that They'll, I This one's eaten up a little bit, but the edges will be toothed. They'll have little teeth on them, little serrated edges. And then once again, like I said, you're looking for that channel in the stem and those vines on the back guys that's plantain and uh, like I said the here's a, another young one it's got some of the teeth but not quite as much and you're looking for those veins on the back like I said take some and once again you gotta understand where nutrition is and where they're sending their energy and right now since I don't have the the stalks coming up on them my the younger pieces is my best bet so just chew it up exposing some of the juices take it and then just rub it on your area and make a, a spit poultice and, uh, and great stuff guys plantain and yarrow man they're super herbs they're super plants used for a, a million different things and as you're out and about watch out for these bad boys get one of those in you you're gonna have a bad day <laughs> well guys I was hoping to find you a couple better examples of broadleaf plantain but I just kind of struck out all I found was some young ones and uh, some of the half-eaten larger ones and so uh, it's part of uh, understanding herbs and they say that the best herb you got is the one you have and so uh, um, the best herb there is is the one you got and so um, it's a lot of it is knowing where they are at and gathering them along the way that possum mentality as you find them But like I said, um, there's numerous examples online So so mainly what you're looking for is the basil leaves with the kind of the wavy edges Some of them have points some of them be more rounded um, Each plant grows a little bit different a little different variations, but you're primarily looking for them veins You're looking for them growing in that that basil patch and you're looking for Sometimes they'll have a, a greenish flower with purplish anthers. Like I said, those, those, the stems on them down deep are going to be purplish. And uh, they bloom in, in the summertime, in the spring. And as they mature and grow, they'll have long spikes coming up out of them with little seeds on them. And so that's plantain, guys. The second plant um, 
is jewel weed and you pretty much do the same thing with it that you do with the the plantain you're trying to break it up expose the uh, the oils in it and with jewel weed you can actually use the stem the stem has oils in it and it's widespread too easily to recognize um, and uh, it's got what's called elliptical coarse tooth sep serrated leaves uh, a lot of description there but it is a native plant it's got a translucent hollow stem and it's in that stem that's got some of the oils and juices so you just break it open and, and put it on your stings or your bites and then like I said third is yarrow and it, it can be used for so many different things from blood clots to to rashes skin irritations and then stings and bites and especially with bites because it'll extract the yarrow will extract the uh, the, especially the poisons from the stings and, and the, the bites. So in exercise number two in module two, we still with bites and now we're looking at snake bites. And the thing that's most important that you understand about snake bites is there's no miracle cure for it as far as instant in the woods. Uh, we got old wise tales where you can suck the venom out of it or cut it open and extract the venom. And they even sell little devices now that can extract the venom. But you'll find that with most of the snakes that are poisonous and venomous in our area, they're going to be pit vipers. And a pit viper, once it bites you and injects that venom, it's toxic to your blood. It's poisoning your blood and it's getting in your bloodstream. And so the most important thing you need to understand when it comes to snakes is the best thing you can do is prevent yourself from being bitten. And I know that seems silly, but prevention is the greatest thing to treating snake bites. Just don't get bit to begin with. And there's a lot of common sense things. You ought to, got to understand snake habitat and where snakes live, where they like to feed, and where they tend to dwell. And so if you know a snake is a cold-blooded and it enjoys the heat, then you know it's going to be in the sun during the cold times, but it also likes to dwell and live under log crevices and in holes and it likes to hunt in tall grasses for prey like mice and so be aware of its habitat and then you can be more conscious of snakes that are in your environment that are in your surroundings but a lot of simple things is don't stick your hands in crevices and holes don't be walking through thick grass without understanding what's around you and especially with logs man so many people are bitten by stepping over a log into a snake's habitat and you have just invaded its space and now it's gonna bite you and so instead of stepping just directly over it and being oblivious the best thing you could do it'd be to step on it look over it or not even step on it but look over it step on it if you need to there's a little hole right here once I see that it's safe, I can step over and clear it. There are other ways, though, that you can treat a snake bite, and heaven forbid you end up getting bitten. The most important thing is once you're bitten is to stay calm. Call and get emergency services. Get, it, get someone who can help you and get to safety as soon as possible. But once again, you have to do it by staying calm. And the key to it is making sure that you understand that this is something that could be life-threatening. So you don't want to just uh, not take it serious. But the most important things to do is be sure that you're not flushing the wound. You can clean up around it if you want. And then make sure that you are immobilizing that extremity. Whatever got bit needs to be immobilized. Now there's a lot of theories about elevations. Um, you definitely don't want to have it above your heart because that venom is going to run into your heart even faster. And you definitely, you know, you don't want to do anything that's going to cause you to your, your heart to pump more blood faster. Anything that's going to require um, more energy and, and ex exerting a lot of energy. You want to stay calm and move at a slow, calm pace. Something else that I didn't mention earlier on the snakes is to remember to get away from it as quickly as possible so it doesn't bite you again. But also... Keep in mind that it's important that you identify what type of snake has bit you um, so that you can inform the medical care the pr providers and so that way they can identify the type of antivenom they might need. Once again, we're here in 
the eastern woodlands and most of the snakes are going to be biting you are pit vipers and so just keep in mind um, in block four i'm going to cover two different types of poisonous uh, venomous animals and i'm going to be talking about the cotton mouth and the um, copperhead and so uh, another primary one we have here in eastern woodlands is the rattlesnake you got timber rattlers pygmy rattlers um, and they're all cut diamond diamond rattlers and so there's all kinds of snakes here but if you can identify the ones that are poisonous you usually don't have to worry about the rest in block three modular three it we're going to be covering breaks and sprains and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this um, because a lot of it's just common sense but it's definitely important that you understand the three different types of mechanical injuries so the three mechanical injuries you have breaks and fractures you have strains and sprains. Now a break or fracture is whenever you have a damaged bone where the continuity of that bone is disrupted through either a crack or a fracture or a complete break where it's a clean break in the bone. Uh, and a strain is caused by overstretching or pulling a muscle or a tendon. This can also be brought on by overuse of that muscle or overextension of that muscle will cause a strain. Typical symptoms will be pain, muscle spasms, weaknesses and swelling, inflammation and cramping due to the, the strain. Whereas a break is going to have uh, bruising and it's going to be sometimes very painful. The third mechanical injury is a sprain and this is caused by an injury where you have put extreme stress on your joints. And in this case, your joints could even rupture or tear, um, which this is also includes not only your joints, but your supporting ligaments. And this can happen through falls, twists, or extreme blows to the body. And this, this loosening, it interferes with how that joint functions. And a lot of things that can, that can help identify that is you'll see some inflammation and you'll see some... Um, some swelling sometimes as well and the best way to treat a strain or a sprain is with rest ice compression and elevation but with a break once again you're wanting to immobilize it and get to a doctor as quickly as possible in exercise two of modular three we're looking at improvised bandages and splints and as we showed earlier you can use something as simple as a bandana for a sling for a bandage and for a wrap. And you can also use this same bandage along with some wood to improvise a splint. And the biggest thing is with a break, a sprain or a strain, you want to immobilize them so that they're not moving and damaging them worse. You also want to immobilize for a snake bite. And that's where we're going to implement this woodsman splint, this outdoor splint. And so we're going to be using a bandana, we're going to be using my jacket, and we're going to be using some good old-fashioned sticks. So stick with me. You're pretty much sawing them out, getting some straight pieces. They're going to work. If you need to, break them. If you ain't got a saw or you don't have the energy to exert, one smaller to go to the inside of the leg, one a little bit longer to go to the outside. And just kind of fill them and see how they fit. And once again, most importantly, we're wanting to keep it from further injury, so we're going to pad that area. And so, I've been wearing my jacket earlier because it was cooler out today. I'm going to wrap my leg in that device. Once again, we're going to be on the ground, most likely. Bringing the sleeve on around on one side. Bringing the sleeve of the other around on the other to attach the top. I can use my bandana to wrap the bottom. Kind of help provide some cloth in place. Once again, you're probably going to be working on a flat surface on the ground, or in this case, up top here. Laying those zip pieces. Beside my leg, I like using a, an overhand loop. Or 
running my cordage in through it. And that gives me something that I can pull against. And what I'm going to do is instead of using a bunch of individual knots for time's sake, I'm just going to wrap it. And just go around it a few times, keeping it tight. Now, once again, if you're doing this on yourself, it, it's going to hurt. <laughs> I mean, you're going to have to move that leg around to keep it immobilized. And just when I get here, I'm just doing three little half inches around the, the thing to secure it in place, cutting off my excess cordage. And tying it off. And so I just ran my strings across and kind of weaved it back and forth. But you could very easily run a string from here to here and tie off, from here to here and tie off. Um, but either way, to get this the most secure you can, you're gonna have to run cordage underneath the leg so you got support on the top and the bottom that's crucial guys you just tie it off at the top and just run a couple around the top and the bottom of the leg it's not going to be real secure you need to run it on top and underneath the leg all the way down you can do this with bank line paracord vines jute twine you name it you can make it happen so the leg splint be sure you're getting out there and practicing these skills, guys. Don't just watch the video. Go outside, put your leg splint on. And you know what? If my kids weren't in school right now, they'd be out here getting leg splints too. They're going to be mad because I didn't put them in this video. <laughs> All right, guys. The last exercise in Module 3 is blisters. And I know we've covered tons of material in this video. And just ask that you bear with me just a little bit longer and understanding that blisters caused by pressure and friction and rubbing on its particular area that causes it to blister up um, and the treatment for this is the best treatment once again like the snake bite is prevention if you start feeling hot spots forming on your foot stop and take your shoes off dry out your socks put on some dry socks and try to pad that area the best you can um, it's important that you do not bust the blister don't bust it because if you bust it you're going to cause yourself to get the the wound to get infected you no longer have a blister you have a wound and don't bust it open unless you have clean antiseptic alcohol and clean dressings to apply and so real quick some of the contributing factors to blisters Expre excess pressure or friction, dirty skin or dirty clothes, wet saturated skin, poor fitting footwear or clothing. And so the best prevention you can do is to stay clean, stay dry, and wear adequate footwear and clothing that's fitted to you. That's why it's so important that you break your boots in, guys. Well, guys, once again, tons of information to pack into one little video for Pathfinder uh, Block 3. But I really didn't want to have three separate parts like I did for module for block two. Um, but hopefully I can get it all in this one video. So keep in mind, the best self-aid is prevention. Be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of those things that are hazardous to you. And especially in a survival situation, use the stop principle. Stop, think, observe, and plan. Stop what you're doing, think about your, what your plan is, observe your surroundings, know what are going to be hazards to you, and plan accordingly, okay? Stop, think, observe, plan. And if you can learn to do that, you're going to lower your risk of injury significantly. And then you won't be having to make a good old-fashioned leg splint. 
You won't be having to worry about treating snake bites. And you won't have to worry about eating these strong herbs and breaking them up to, uh, to take care of bug bites and wounds. So, Well, guys, thanks again so much for sticking with me throughout this video. I know it's a little long and not a lot of... Uh, uh, educational more infra, a lot of practicality as far as application but more education and so but thanks again guys for sticking with me this is Justin Williams again here with Dirt Time Adventures remember get a kiddo out in the woods and keep it practical primitive and prepared <laughs>